think now we're recording. Okay. So anyway, you, we just showed the video of the Tuskegee syphilis study. It's a very famous study for unethical um, treatment. Um, and in, inspired the, actually the next day, well, it inspired the study to end the next day. And it caused Congress to act. And because of, uh, because of that, um, we're going to be doing chapter 10, which is medical ethics. Okay, due to the Tuskegee syphilis study, Congress enacted laws on ethics. Okay, now two of the main things they did was one, they started what's called the institutional institutional review board. A lot of times that's abbreviated IRB. Okay. The purpose of the the purpose is to protect patients from unethical studies. Now, I've actually posted my notes in the, um, uh, on Canvas, so you can, you can see that. I've also got a link to a Nazi brain study, okay? So during World War II, the Nazis would, uh, in fact, they talked a little bit about um, taking some Jews to a gas chamber and killing them. Um, normally, they would incinerate their bodies, but they did save a few and decided, oh, we're going to study their brains, okay? And these were discovered in the 1980s. <laughs> Still, these brains of some of these Jewish people that were killed in the 1980s. Now, we think uh, when, when it comes to medical ethics, of course, we would never do anything so atrocious as those awful Nazis. Um, but you can see here in the Tuskegee <laughs> Civilist Study, we still do some questionable things, okay? So uh, the purpose of the Institutional Review Board, they couldn't care less if your statistics are good or bad. Their purpose is to protect patients, okay? And it must have non-medical participants on the board. Why do you think they would want non-medical participants on the board? So it's not biased. Not biased, what do you mean by that? That um, the intentions aren't purely for medical reasons. They're not purely for medical reasons, okay? Because sometimes doctors can get a little blind, you know. One of the things about this Nazi study, um, it's a little bit longer of a video, but, uh, but I, I, I would encourage you to watch that, it's about 10 minutes long, is because there can be some tremendous benef medical benefits from these people that were literally exterminated by the Germans. Okay, should that be used? Some of these brains were used in medical textbooks in Germany. What do you think? Should we use data and information from people that were exterminated? Is that ethical? I think it's like information Okay, a lot of Germans are saying, so you're saying that maybe it could be useful, and it could be useful. Um, but it was obtained unethically, okay? There are a lot of people that say that those should be destroyed, that information be, should be destroyed because it was obtained unethically. Because when you continue to use unethically contained material, yes, it could benefit mankind, but then you're encouraging further unethical studies. So, um, so that's pretty interesting. Now, another rule about the Institutional Review Board is it can be, um, can have more stringent rules than federal law, okay? Now, I'll tell you, I used to, when I graduated from the University of Utah a few years ago, my first job was working on a brain injury study. One of the things that um, 
the researchers wanted to know was, um, does the experience of the um, of the clinician does that help improve outcomes of the patient? Okay. So uh, one of the things that well, so one of the interesting things is we actually had a um, a hospital up in Canada, up in Toronto, that was in our in our study. So we had nine in the U.S. and one in Canada. And they actually had even more stringent requirements in the United States. In the United States, we could just ask the clinician, so how many years have you done it? You know, what's your occupation? Some things like that. In Canada, they required everybody, all of the clinicians, to actually sign off uh, consent to be in this study. The U.S. didn't require that, but in Canada, they did. So um, even in Canada, they have more stringent requirements. Another example, um, so one of the laws of the federal government is that when you die, you lose all your privacy rights. Okay. Now, one of the nice things about that is, let's say you were doing a study um, and you wanted to find out if people were wearing seatbelts uh, in, in a car crash. Well, it's nice because you don't have to go back to every family and say, hey, your loved one died in a car accident. Can they be in our study? You can just do the study because they're already dead. So that's what federal, so federal law says if a person dies, they lose all their privacy and, and they could be included in the study. So that's what federal law says. So the problem is, in our study, we would try to enroll people in the study as soon as possible. So a person gets injured, you know, in a car crash or a boating accident or a football game, whatever, whatever it is. They would come to the emergency room. We wanted to collect the data as soon as they came to the emergency room. Well, if they're unconscious, obviously they can't consent. Okay? So you'd have to talk to the family. Hey, we're doing this study. Sometimes the family would want to think about it for a few days. Um, and so sometimes the patient in, that, in those few days would die. Okay. Now, federal law says, well, they're dead. You can automatically enroll them in the study because death obviously was something we were concerned about. Okay. Now, uh, in New York, for example, they said, ah, that's not good enough. We, uh, we still think that you should require the family to consent in order for them to be in the study. And so the IRB in New York and every, every college or university has a, anybody who does any sort of medical research like this has an institutional review board and they have to sign off on this. And so they can create laws that are, or create rules that are more stringent than federal law. So in, the, in the one case, I think in Chicago, the patient died, we automatically enrolled them in the study. In New York, they said, no, we still have to get consent from the family to enroll them in the study. And that's perfectly fine. Because um, once again, the purpose is to protect patients. It, they don't care about your statistics. Okay. Another thing that's required is what's called informed consent. And the idea is the patient must be advised of possible risks. Okay. Now we'll talk a little bit about more about informed consent in, in just a minute. But um, in this Tuskegee syphilis study, you notice um, they said, "Oh, possible barrier. We might you know, we might enroll you in a study, and we might not let the barrier you. You know, you might, you might do anything you want." That's against the law now. Okay. Um, the other the other horrible thing about the Tuskegee syphilis study. Do you guys know what cure syphilis? In the ceiling. So when they started the syphilis study, there was no cure for syphilis. But it went on from the 30s to the 70s. And okay? so it went on for 40 years. And then I wouldn't say the 40s or 50s, penicillin became a known cure. Okay? Now, these, these black patients in Tuskegee, Alabama, were purposely denied treatment that would cure them of syphilis. So they not only infected their wives, but their children. Um, and it was just awful. Okay, that's unethical to do. Um, and they, they certainly were denied 
their rights to informed consent. Okay, um, so that that's just completely unethical. Um, let's talk a little bit about more about informed consent. Okay, so um, children can't consent. Okay. B, you can remove consent at any time. Okay? So let me tell you a, a situation that happened to me. So my first child, the one I was just telling you about at the sophomore in high school now, <laughs> when he was born, uh, they asked us if he wanted, if we would participate in a in a study on oh, what's it called? It wasn't RSV. It was it was that stomach disease that children can get. Anyway, this this study on uh, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, so they were like, we'll pay you twenty five bucks or whatever. He has to have three or four shots over every few months or something like that. And so I was like, oh, this is a great idea. Contribute to medical research. This will be awesome. And so clearly an infant can't consent. So, so they fulfilled the, the requirement that children can't consent. Now, um, problem was a few months later, um, my wife was changing his diaper and there was blood in his diaper. So she became concerned as any mother would be. Um, they took him up with primary children's, if you can imagine, a two or three month old baby trying to get him in an MRI machine and hold him still. Wasn't, wasn't a good thing. It was awful. Okay? So they went through, they were concerned that he had some sort of a bowel problem, life threatening, or whatever. Turns out that basically they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And they said, well, maybe he's allergic to breast milk. Which I thought was the strangest explanation I've ever heard. Um, I still don't believe it. <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, maybe it's that vaccine that he had. And so I removed consent, and he got no more shots after that. Okay. Now, what was the problem? He's grown up healthy. He's fine. I don't know what the problem was, but I removed consent at any time, and he did not finish. Okay. That's part of the, the laws that the Institutional Review Board passed, number one, children can't consent, and it, consent can be removed at any time. Now, the problem is, another problem, people with mental disorders can't consent. Okay, now, if you're doing a study on Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that, you need people with mental problems, right? So you, a lot of times you're going to have to get uh, some kin to, to, to do that. And also it can be hard to consent, you know, Alzheimer's patients. Alzheimer's, I don't know how you spell that. Okay. Now that can get really tricky, okay? Let's say, for example, it can be very hard to determine. You've got a 72 year old man in the hospital. Um, he, the doctor says, Hey, you're dying, you need a feeding tube. Okay? You stick a tube up your nose and, and feed you that way. So he says, Okay. So then the nurse comes in here and hey, let me shove this thing up your nose. And he says, No, I get that thing away from you. Okay? Now the patient can remove consent at time. So she can't actually put that in. Now the doctor comes back in later and says, hey, we, remember we talked about this? Oh yeah, I remember now. So has the patient consented or not? You know, they can remove consent at any time. These, these can get really tricky, especially when you're dealing with, with mental disorders. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention um, about children can't consent here, um, one of the greatest medical breakthroughs has been the polio vaccine, okay? Now that was done, I think in the 30s or 40s, I don't remember exactly, um, when they came up with that vaccine, it was a guy by the name of Jonas Salk. 
um, one of the things that he did was he tested it on a, an orphanage and says, hey, let's give these kids this vaccine. The first one, the first one didn't do so well. A lot of the kids died. Okay. And the thought was, oh, well, you know, they're just orphans. Nobody will care, right? Is that ethical? Okay. Second batch worked really well. He could not have done that study now because now we require that the children can't consent. You're going to need some sort of a, a person to, to consent that. Okay. Um, another rule here. Data must be kept confidential. Okay. Um, it doesn't have to be anonymous. Anonymous. Okay. Now, anonymous. What does anonymous mean? Anonymous means you can't tie back the um, the study to a specific individual. So, a lot of times, if we ask you, like if I were to ask. Um, you know, how many of you have ever done illegal drugs? Okay, show by the of hands, right? You think I'm going to get a lot of honest answers if I do something like that? So one way to improve feedback is I may pass out a survey. Don't put your name on it. How many of you have done illegal drugs? That can be a way to help people feel more comfortable um, answering that type of question. Okay. So anonymity can be great. The problem is, what if I can't read your handwriting? Sometimes then I, I can't, I, so, so that can be a problem. So a lot of times we'll make things confidential. Oh, put your name on here, or, or I'll, I'll assign you some sort of an ID number so that if I go back. So for instance, um, so confidentiality is important, is really important. So when we were working on this brain injury study, um, one of the things that we would do is, you know, the hospitals, they would know who their patients were. They would do the blood draws. They would do everything they needed to do. Um, and then they assign each patient an ID number. Okay? I never knew the names of the patients. If I did, I would send it back and say, you weren't supposed to send that to me. I'm just trying. Okay? But what would happen is they would send me information. Hey, this is ABC123. This is patient ABC123, for example. And let's say that they weighed 3,000 pounds. And I would say, wow, that seems kind of hefty. Could you check that weight again? I think there's a typo. And I would say, go back and check ABC123. They would go to ABC123. Oh, that's John Smith or whoever it is. Oh, yeah, he weighs 300 pounds, not 3,000 pounds. And so one of the nice things about confidentiality is you are able to go back and um, correct errors, or you could ask the patient, oh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't read your handwriting or, or whatever. And so make sure you understand the difference between confidential and anonymous. The main difference is anonymous, you can't trace it back to the person. Confidential, you can, but, but you just don't publish that information. Does that make sense? Okay. Another thing that the Institutional Review Board is due no harm. Okay. So the idea, well, what I would like to do here, I think, I want to show another video for you. Okay. I, don't, I would like to pause the broadcast somehow. Well, I'll stop it. We'll, we'll just stop it. I'll have a two, two broadcasts, I guess, today. So I want to show another video. This is going to be Mythbusters. How many of you have ever watched Mythbusters in a class before? In a class? Okay. So here we go. I've got this Mythbusters episode for you. <laughs> 